Hey, I'm Chris Zemp from Make Everything, and today we are making this massive four foot by 11 foot hard maple table with powder coated steel legs. Check it out. All right, so getting started on this project required a lot of time milling up this material. Now the lumber yard that I purchased my hardwood from sells rough sawn material mostly. Um, sometimes you get lucky and it's been skip sanded or dressed, but in this case, the eight quarter hard maple that I bought was rough sawn. So we ran it all through the seven and a half horsepower Delta planer. And basically we were just going for a consistent thickness. Now I put a DRO on this planer and there's a video of that. I'll put a link in the little bubble that pops down on the video right here. So I set all these to 1.9 inches. It was just a little bit under that eight quarter and got me past that rough sawn surface and made these boards nice and smooth. Now I thought I was gonna have to run these through the drum sander as well, but honestly the planer did such a nice job. I changed the blades right before this job and everything came out super smooth and flat. I was really happy with that. After we got the boards through the planer, it was time to select where they were gonna go and which board was gonna go where. You know, this table is going in a conference room. It's gonna be looked at by people all the time. I wanted to make sure that I chose boards that had the right character and the right kind of grain and really left me with the proper effect. So me and Max spent some time flipping through the boards, kind of figuring out where there were bad inclusions and where there were bad sort of grain marks or knots and we didn't want to see. And we made sure that we moved the boards around and numbered them once we had a nice orientation. We had one extra board, so I had one that I could sort of put off to the side if I didn't like it. And this job is all gonna take place in the machine shop. Now, my machine shop, sort of half a machine shop and half kind of an accessory room in the shop. I like to keep it empty for projects like this and for staging and moving stuff around. Um, so I have a nice big open area that I can get to this project from all sides. And that's a big deal when you're making a table like this. I could have done this on my big assembly table, but the table is seven by 11 and it's just too big and too hard to get to. With this, you'll be able to sand it and get to it, no problem. We set it up on four saw horses. I really wanted to make sure it stayed nice and stable. Then I began the unbelievably laborious process of ripping these boards down and squaring up the edge. In my head, this was gonna be super easy. I thought I was gonna be able to just set up my track and run my track saw across these boards, cut them down. I figured it would take me an hour, maybe two hours to get everything nice and square in the same size. I was so absolutely wrong. I had such a hard time ripping these boards down. The battery saw just could not handle it. The hard maple was absolutely bogging it down. It was burning and binding. Um, I destroyed the splinter guard on my track um, just because the blade was warping so much from this cut. So I was basically, you know, totally at my wits end. I didn't know what to do. I was posting on Instagram and a friend of mine on Instagram named Jeremy hit me up and said, listen, I have a Festool TS-55. I would ha happily lend it to you for this process. So I went out and I bought a Festool ripping blade and I don't have any clips of it in here, but I wound up using the TS-55 and the Festool ripping blade to rip these down. Now, the purpose of using the track saw versus the table saw is that the track saw is very definite. It's gonna give you a perfectly straight cut as long as your saw doesn't bind. And I don't have to worry about manhandling these massive boards and material through the table saw. That can be really, really difficult. Once I had all the boards ripped up, I was able to get them all together and know that things were gonna stay tight. And after thinking about it, I was originally going to use biscuits to keep this table together. But if you've done a lot of furniture building, you know, you've come across this maybe once or twice, but I've seen biscuits shear in half when, you know, tables wanna warp or move. And I really didn't wanna risk that here. So I asked around and found myself a domino joiner from none other than Jimmy DeResta who lent me his. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Could not have done it without this and the TS-55 from Jeremy. 
But with the domino joiner, you're able to do a really nice oblong dowel and you get a really, really strong and really well registered dowel that goes in between your boards and really keeps your stability up. I used 10 millimeter by 50 millimeter dominoes on this and I really felt that they added to the stability and also the ease of assembly of this whole project. Those dominoes are pretty tight and it really just makes it so that when you go to line this thing up for glue, you don't have to worry so much about the boards being uneven. I mean, obviously there's still a little bit of collect correction, but for the most part, it's pretty perfect. Before I did any gluing, I did test assemble the entire board, uh, the entire table. I took the whole table, I put in every single domino, and I wedged every single board together just to make sure it would fit. And here I'm using the Total Boat High Performance Epoxy. Uh, this stuff is fantastic. It dries up super hard, but also has a little bit of flexibility to it. It's got a nice long working time, so I had plenty of time to mix it and glue these boards up. And this was probably one of the more nerve wracking parts of the process was just getting this glue mixed and evenly spreading it across the boards, making sure that, you know, I got good coverage. I was also trying to make sure that the insides of the domino holes got filled and everything stayed together uh, after this glue dried. So I took some, took some serious time here to put the glue on the board, put some glue inside the domino holes, drop the dominoes in, put glue on the other side of the corresponding board and flip that over onto it. Um, and I really wanted to make sure I had a great registration on this. So I did sort of temporarily put some clamps on these as I glued them up. Obviously the final clamping was a whole different story, but since this had a nice long working time, I did have enough time to glue this up, clamp it as I went and then get the final clamps on there while everything was still active and none of the glue had started to set up yet. My process for gluing these up was sort of to do it in two halves. So the entire piece is eight boards wide. So what I did was I would do four boards and then four boards and then grab those and clamp them together. So basically what I could stand up on edge was what I was trying to work with just because it sort of made it a little more manageable. And since I have gloves on, I can sort of manhandle this stuff. I don't really have to worry about, you know, getting glue on my hands. I did get glue all over the floor, but at the end of the day, that's no big deal. Once I had everything glued up, I put these DeWalt quick clamps on and, and these were just temporarily to hold together, but I really wanted to get these two by sixes on the ends and those would sort of keep it from crowning. So before I put the final clamps on there, I really wanted to get those on and make sure that nothing moved around too much and try to keep everything nice and flat. Even with the dominoes, the board still did come up and down a little bit. So I went back in with a hammer and a block and I just knocked down some of the boards that I thought were a little bit high. I tightened everything up really well and everything turned out really nice and pretty flat. The cleanup on this as recommended by Total Boat is soap and water. So I went and wiped down any of the squeeze out. And again, thank you so much to Total Boat for supplying me with the epoxy for this project. Uh, there'll be some links in the description on where you can check this stuff out. It's a really great product. I gave this stuff 48 hours to fully cure up before I removed the clamps. And once I did, I was left with a really nice and flat tabletop. I was really happy with the way the glue up turned out. Um, and I think the four sawhorses really helped just to make sure that none of that wood moved around. Um, that was kind of a concern of mine, was a big crown. Now, once I had it glued up, I could take the TS-55 that I got from Jeremy and rip down the length of the table. I actually wind up cutting this a second time later on because the original table was four foot by 12 foot, but the client realized that maybe 12 foot was too big for their conference room. So we did cut it down to 11 foot after the fact. So here you can see cutting down the length of this. And I did leave it about an inch long at this point, but it all gets sanded uh, and cut down to the finished size a little bit later. Now I did do some preliminary sanding. I'm using a Mirka Dero sander. This thing is unbelievable. Uh, it's the best sander I've ever used by far. And I started with 80 grit paper. And once I felt that the tabletop was ready and in a good place, I moved over to the steel work. Now the steel work on this job seemed like an easy little section of it. I thought it was gonna be no big deal when I thought about it, but it turned into way more work than I thought it was gonna be. Um, these legs are a Y shaped with two barrels running down that are welded only at the top and bottom so that you can see the 
factory seam in between them and getting the angles all correct was very tricky. I did create a setup on the computer um, and that helped me get the angles but I did do some preliminary test cuts and then I made a jig to make all the cuts the same. Okay, so here's what I got. Um, I made these two story poles, right? So one of these is 18 and an eighth inches long from here to the end. And the other one is 20 and 3 eighths inches long from here to the end. And those correspond with my measurements to the long point on my pieces. Now they have the same angle, so I don't have to worry about resetting the saw. But by doing it this way, I make sure that every piece that I cut is gonna be identical. So I'll have two of these and two of these. I won't have to worry about measuring and getting things correct and getting the angle correct. I can just use these. So I'll mark these so I know which one is which and I'm good to go to cut all six pieces. And I've said this before in other videos in the past that any time you can avoid measuring, you should. Um, measuring is a surefire way to make errors in your process. So with these little story poles, and you'll see eventually I wind up actually cutting the story pole at the angle so that I can knock the blade right up against it. These made it so that I didn't even really have to think about the way I was cutting these. Here you'll be able to see me cut the wood. You know, that's really important. You know, you have to make six of these cuts. They all have to be the same. I don't want to have to go back and correct these later um, or have legs that are all different shapes and sizes. So a little bit of time making these little story poles out of just some scrap wood saves you the risk of making a mistake. Also, you know, material is expensive. If I cut one of these at the wrong dimension, I might not have enough to actually finish the job or it might, you know, just be a costly mistake that I don't want to make. So just a little bit of planning can really make sure that you don't waste any time or material. Once I had the first pieces cut, I laid them out on the table, got everything lined up, and sort of just got an idea of what these legs were going to look like. I do have a sketch that I did on the computer, and that was sort of my guide. I wanted to make sure that all the dimensions I had on my sketch matched what I had in real life. And I'm using this Lincoln multi-position angle magnet, uh, and what that's going to do is it's going to force all my legs to be in the exact same angle, even if the miters aren't exactly perfect. Um, I set this thing, and clamped it down super hard, and it did not move at all. It's a really versatile tool, really nice for clamping up angles like that. Now, I had those all set up, all the legs were cut. These are the crossbars that'll go on top of the legs, the spreaders. Um, you're gonna notice that this is two, this is one by two material, but I needed to cut one by three material, so I actually had to go back and recut that. No big deal. Um, I did chamfer all my tubing before I welded it. This is eighth wall tubing. It is two inches by three inch rectangle, and I wanted to make sure that I had a nice penetrated weld on there. I am gonna be using a Lincoln 140 on this. Um, I was going with a little bit smaller of a machine. I wanted to see how capable it was, and honestly, it performed incredibly well. It stood up to the task, and you know, this is an awesome machine. I've done videos about this machine before, but there'll be links below so that you can check this thing out. So you see, I'm basically just using that angle magnet to clamp this work, and I'm welding the outside with some tacks, and then I go in, weld the inside and outside with a full bead, and come around the piece sort of full circle to weld this thing really full on and through. I'm gonna be going and grinding all these welds flat, but I wanna make sure that this piece is extremely strong, hence why I chamfered those tubes beforehand, and I make sure that I put real solid beads on here just to make sure that everything stays nice and tight. Once I had the two pieces welded, I could do a little clamping and just get an idea of how these legs were gonna look when they were stood up. Um, it's a pretty simple design, but you know that line makes them look super elegant and once they're powder coated, they really do look nice. Once I had all the pieces welded up individually, I took them outside and I started grinding them out. Um, I wanted to make sure that everything was ground down and pretty close to complete prior to welding them together because I didn't want to have to manhandle them when they were that heavy and large. I'm using the fared uh, polyfan discs here and their polyfleas 
which is a grinding and polishing disc. It's amazing. It's like halfway a grinding disc and halfway a scotch bright disc. And once you get past some of that major grinding, it really gives a beautiful surface finish. That along with this variable speed Milwaukee grinder, um, it's something that I learned from the Faird guys and it really makes a difference. Another Faird product that really, really helps is these round edge um, grinding discs. Now this grinding disc can grind on the very nose of it. This is made for doing inside corner welds. This saved me so much time in cleaning up these inside welds. The disc can grind upside down if you wanted to. Um, really, really made quick work of this. And then again, using that combo scotch bright and grinding disc to polish everything up once I was done with the majority of the grinding. There'll be links in the description of this video where you can get stuff like that. Really nice stuff. Now once everything was ground out, I could go back to clamping the legs together and seeing how everything lined up. Now, you know, they all should have been the same and they all were very close to the same. So once I got them clamped up, I could kind of line them up, see how they looked, and then I could start welding them together. I wanted to make sure everything was clamped in tight and then I tacked the bottom of sort of the crotch there, added a tack on the top of both sides and was able to roll the pieces around and sort of manipulate them a little bit better. You know, I wanted everything tight and welded before I started moving stuff around. And I intentionally left these legs a little bit long when I made them uh, for two reasons. One, because I wanted to cut the, the top piece flat, and two, because I wasn't sure how we were gonna do the leg detail. Uh, we made a quick change, and we wound up going from this sort of point in the ground detail to a flush detail, so I used a little scribe, and I cut these legs level with what would be the floor, using both the porta band and the um, metal saw. And this just gave a super nice and clean look. I was really happy with this decision in the end. I wanted here though to cut them all to the exact same length. So once I had one of the legs cut, I set up a little jig on the metal cutting saw using a piece of steel to accomplish this extreme angle. And I made another one of those little stop blocks so that I could set it up and cut all six of the actual individual legs to the exact same length and the exact same angle. It was important to me that this stuff be correct because if it wasn't, it would sort of transfer out and something would wind up being crooked. So clamping and cutting and clamping and cutting till everything was done. Okay, so I want to explain my setup here. So I just cut the bottoms of these legs based on those scribes, but I want to make sure that this column is square in relationship to the ground. So I took this drywall square and I drew a line up my table. And then I took my Ollie iron jigs and I clamped them to the bottom of my table. So basically this is acting as the floor in reference to the edge of the table itself. So now what I can do is line the bottom of my crotch up over here with my line which I have represented by another one of these squares and see if I'm hitting both of my blocks. Now I'm about an eighth of an inch high on one of these legs, which means I need to bring this leg down. I need to scribe and cut to match so that when these hit, this is nice and dead level. Now, since I'm only doing one of these right now, I'm gonna do this first one and then I'm gonna use this as the template to mark the other ones. This little system actually worked really well. Setting up these Ali iron squares made this whole process pretty easy. Um, I wound up being able to trace them out, make sure everything was exactly where it needed to be. And then I sort of just referenced off that first one and used it to trace out my other ones and just kind of know that I was gonna be in the right spot. At the end of the day, the jig that I made wound up being sort of the be all end all decision. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I was getting close and that my angle was correct before I made my cuts. So all that little reference stuff, like I said earlier, it's all about the you know efficiency of the work and making sure that you're not making a major mistake that could cost you time or money when you're doing a project like this. So you can see how I'm cutting and checking and then going back and checking again. With all those cut, I can start to weld on the stretchers. Now these are one inch by three inch eighth wall pieces of tubing and I am checking first for the finished height of the table. Now we're going for a 29 and a half inch finished height from the floor to the top of the tabletop. 
So that with the legs that I have there, you can see how I made some marks. And I mentioned earlier that I left the legs long so they could be cut down to fit. Here it's important for me to make sure that my saw is cutting perfectly square and that my material is properly supported. And then I just take the saw and I rip off the remaining material on the tops of these legs so that I can go ahead and weld them up. Before I do the welding, I take the stretchers over to the drill press where I set up a little temporary fence and I drill in eight holes um, for three eighths inch stainless steel bolts to bolt these legs to the table. Another thing I need to do is cap the ends of those one by three tubes that I cut the miter on earlier in the video. And I do that with just some eighth inch pieces of plate and a little magnet to hold it in place while I tack them and weld them. Little details like this make a big difference for your client and they make a big difference on your project. You know, when someone reaches their hand into the table, do you want them to feel a nice, smooth, chamfered edge or do you want them to feel something sharp that they can maybe like cut their fingers on or put their fingers in? So I thought it was important to cap all the tubing and grind everything out with the fair discs just to make sure it was really, really smooth and well blended. Um, I started here with one of their rougher uh, grinding discs and I move over into that polyfleece disc that really takes the finish up to the next level and does the grinding and scotch bright surface finishing at the same time. Once those were ground and prepped, I could go ahead and square them up to the top. You can see my center mark there marks the center of my two pieces of tubing. And again, I'm using these squares to make sure that everything stays nice and level. You can see how everything is really close. The evolution saw, when it's set, it really does cut the material really straight, which is nice. And I'm starting here with some tacks, four tacks, so that I can just make sure that this piece of steel never moves. Now, I did make a bit of a mistake here. I definitely underestimated the amount of warping I would get on this tubing. Normally, I would clamp stuff down right from the get-go, but I kind of thought that this stuff was stout enough that it wasn't going to warp. It's okay. You know, I come up with a solution a little bit further down in the video on how to correct that, but... You can see I put some time into these welds here. I wanna make sure these welds are really solid. And at this point I have noticed some of the warp, so I clamp the piece down and really make sure that those inside corner welds are very well penetrated and they are not gonna go anywhere. Now here's how I straighten these bent stretchers. I decided I would take my torch, my oxyacetylene torch, heat these pieces up red hot so that they were a little malleable and then use this stretcher bar and some vice grips to clamp them up and then douse them with water. The dousing with water was critical because the dousing with water was, I felt, the catalyst for shrinking the tubing back. Look at that. Perfectly flat. Now I did try this a couple of times before I got it to work correctly and the water really was the difference that made it work. Now with those legs complete, I'm able to cut the quarter inch thick plate that will act as the bottom of the foot and get the bolt and hole for the leveling foot that's gonna go on the table, um, one on each of the six legs. So I'm taking that quarter inch thick by four inch wide uh, plate and cutting it in two directions so that I get a plate that's small enough to fit inside the angled foot and I'm marking the center on here. Once I have the center marked, I go over to the drill press and I drill some holes so that I can fit a 3 8 bolt through there because the leveling feet I got are 3 8 Now what I'm gonna be using here is a special weldable nut and I'm just making sure these things stay nice and centered and I'm bolting them on and unbolting them with the drill so I don't burn myself but so also I can keep working efficiently and get these things welded so on. So this isn't a normal nut. This is a weld nut. This is an uncoated steel nut and it's got these little tabs. What that does is it gives a nice little gap to get a weld down in there. These things are fantastic if you do a lot of hardware work because you don't have to grind that zinc plating off. So I'm using these for the leveling feet. I order them from McMaster Car. I'll put a link in the description on where you can get these. They make them in every different size. Once I got all those welded up, I was able to go over and start putting them into the feet of the legs themselves. And I start with a bunch of tacks and I'm using magnets to hold them up and I can just fully weld them in. It's very important that these welds be good because all the way to the table is going to be pushing on these welds. 
the legs are only as good as the welds that are holding them off the ground. So once those were all welded up, again, right back outside, you're gonna notice that I like to do a lot of my heavy metal grinding outside. It just keeps the dust out of my shop, which is fantastic. And I, you know, I don't love to clean it all up. So it works out that if the weather is good and I can get some time in outside on some grinding, it's absolutely preferred. Once all the grinding was done, I took this cup wire wheel from Farad and I ground in some of that to clean off some of the little BBs that got stuck during the welding process and prep these to eventually be powder coated matte black. I laid out my holes for these legs on the table using the square and figuring out where these things were going to live. Now, in order to mount these into the table, I'm using a threaded in insert that I got from McMaster. It's what can be called a knife thread insert, which is made for hardwood. It's a very heavy duty threaded insert for wood, not really like a run of the mill hardware store item. You want to get something that's really, really good when you're dealing with stuff that's this heavy and has this much leverage on it. <laughs> I drilled in my spots for these screws using just the regular hand drill um, and I'm using the socket wrench to set these and I did a couple of pull tests on these just to make sure that these things are really going to hold tight and I was incredibly impressed with how strong they were. I was able to bend a bunch of pieces of plate trying to pull out the screws so I felt confident that these were going to stay. What I did notice though was that the holes that I drilled in the tops of the spreaders were not big enough so I do go back and make those a little bit wider and I had to scrape off any leftover epoxy that might have been in the table or filling any of the voids and would have been in the way. Now obviously here it's very important not to drill through the table so you saw the little blue tape flag that I had on the drill bit and once I get all my little screw and anchor set I can really get an idea of how the table is going to sit together and how it's going to work. I go back and I drill out all the holes in my legs and this will also give me a little opportunity for the wood to move without being bound up by the steel itself. So that'll be helpful. And I also take a little die grinder and I grind in the letters and numbers that correspond each leg to its specific location on the table because after the powder coat, you will not be able to see anything you write on there in Sharpie or in pen. So after getting the legs back from the powder coater, I take a little tap, a 3 8 16 tap in my drill and I run it through all the threaded inserts. I noticed that the threads were a little crummy on these and I didn't want to have any binding issues. I didn't want anything to get stuck or break. So I made sure to chase all those threads out and then I'm able to put in all my screws and tighten them up as I go with the powder coated legs all finished. Now I had my concerns about the table warping. I mentioned them in the beginning, but they really started to settle in as the project was kind of starting to get close to the completion. I was originally going to use some C-channel, but I decided that one inch by one inch eighth wall square tubing would be a stronger support to router into the bottom of the table. I cut it up and then I drilled some holes and countersank those holes for screws that could screw this steel into the bottom of the table and give it some extra stability just in case it ever wanted to cup or move on us. I wanted it to stay super, super strong. Once I had everything drilled, I ground it out, and then I'm actually gonna paint these pieces of steel so that they're nice and flat black, just like the legs are. But before I do that, I'm going to take them and trace them onto the bottom side of the table so I have an idea of where I need to run my router and get these things cut into the table and sitting nice and flush. I throw a little bit of paint on these outside and then I go to work on getting these things routed into the bottom of the table. Now I say routed into the bottom of the table because that was the first thing that popped into my mind was to use the router for this task. Turned out the router was a real nightmare for this. Again, the hard maple was just such a bear to use and the router I have is not that great. It, it kind of put up a fight. It was jumping around. It was, it was just sketchy. It took me probably 25 minutes to route this first channel in and you know having to do four of these I really didn't want to spend like two hours on this and there had to be a better way so the first channel I did with the router and it came out nice I made sure that it looked really nice you know I didn't want to give any sort of subpar product but after I used the router on this one I thought about it and I realized that I could use the track saw and the track 
to cut in the router, the routed channel, and then take a chisel and the router to just clean it up. You know, I wanted the bulk of my material removal to be dust free and a little more easily managed. So by using the track saw and moving the track basically a sixteenth of an inch at a time, I'm able to make a couple of cuts. Um, I think I made like eight or ten altogether on each of them. But you can see how fast that is. You know, I'm able to just push the saw across. I set little stop blocks on my track to stop my saw from going too far. And then I'm using a piloted uh, bearing bit anyway, a three quarter inch bearing bit. And that means that my router is gonna follow in that nice perfect track that I cut in with the track saw. So at the end, this was a really nice way to do it. I'm really happy that I kind of discovered this process because you can see how nice that channel looks. In reality, this took like maybe 10 minutes and I got a way better result than I did with the router and I didn't have to worry about ruining anything. And that's like a huge deal. I always get nervous that router bits are gonna creep downward and cut through your material. So I have a little bit of a bad experience with that in the past. Now I decided to glue in the steel one by one. And what I did was I put in some PL and then I sprayed it with water as per the recommendations and then used screws to screw the one by one into the table. Now I got some comments on Instagram about this, about how the table was gonna move and whether or not it was gonna break. I really wanted to try and correct the warping. I have put steel in tables in very similar methods before and I haven't had any problems. So I'm optimistic that this is gonna to stay together really well and that the glue and the steel are not gonna create any cracking or stress. The wood that I got is very dry and I think everything's gonna be okay. But I did want to make sure that I didn't get any crowning and this one by one absolutely made it so that this table sat really nice and flat. While the glue was setting, I wanted to make sure it was as flat as possible, so I did add in some bracing and tighten up the legs, and when I was done, everything looked really nice. One last thing to do to the legs was to drill in a two inch hole for an extension cord to run down. And here I'm just using a two inch bimetal hole saw, and this is like a run of the mill like hardware store or Home Depot hole saw. And if you just take it slow and, and really let those teeth do their job, you can drill through eighth inch steel with no problem at all. So I am masking off with the blue tape because I don't want these metal shards to scratch this really nice matte black paint job that I got from my friend Justin at On Point Powder Coating. Put some links to his operation too. He's another young guy just trying to make it and you know really hustling and he does a really nice job. Really happy with the way these came out. So you'll notice there I took the actual hole saw off the arbor to drill the pilot hole. That's because I didn't want the drill to slip in when it got through and then catch and maybe, you know, bind up and scratch the metal. Once all that hole drilling was done, I take the little die grinder, the 12 volt Milwaukee one, and I just grind out the insides of those holes so they're nice and smooth in case anyone ever gets their fingers in there and they don't get cut. And now we can finally flip the table over and start to finish the top. Now with the table flipped over, Nicholas can go to town sanding it. Um, Nicholas came in sort of, you know, out of the blue on this job and really saved me. Um, you know, his attention to detail is fantastic. And, you know, after we filled a couple of these voids, he spent a lot of time sanding this piece. Um, while he was sanding it, I came in and I drilled the holes for the power ports that are going to go in this. These are two... AC outlet, two USB outlet power ports, and I had spaced them, drawn lines, pre-drilled holes with the drill uh, in the arbor, and then clamped this block to the table to drill the final hole. Now, this block and this guide piece is not really necessary, but it keeps you from ever slipping out of the hole with the hole saw and potentially ruining all that work. Now Nicholas really, like I said, went to town sanding this thing. We sanded the whole thing with 80 grit. He must have gone through 30 pieces of sandpaper. Uh, the Mirka really shined for him. And then once we were done with the 80, we went up to 140 based on the Rubio mono coat recommendations that I read online about leaving a sort of toothy finish as opposed to a glass smooth finish when you're gonna use Rubio mono coat. 
After Nicholas was done sanding and we decided to coat it, I took the air compressor and blew off any of the dust and mixed up two small cans of the oil Rubio Monaco Pure and the hardener, and I started applying it with the squeegee. Now this is the first time I've used Rubio Monocoat on a piece this large, and it was definitely challenging. Um, I spread it around with the squeegee, and then I use a car buffer to buff it in. You know, I was a little more nervous about the process than I probably should have been, which maybe made me a little bit skittish, but it worked out really well in the end. I'm really happy with the way the finish came out, and the Rubio Monocoat hardens up incredibly well and gets super, super nice and very durable. Now we had some extra Rubio Mono Coat as well, so me and Nick decided to go under the table and actually coat the underside of the table just to make sure that when you put your hands down there, you know, you weren't feeling any sort of uneven or raw surfaces. And also really took my time to buff in that Mono Coat and make sure that it, you know, really penetrated and was shined on there. It brought out so much nice texture and grain from the maple. I'm really happy that I chose this as a finish. You can see Nicholas coating the bottom with the mono coat while I finish the top. Now once all the coating was done, I let a day go by and then we wrapped it up and ready to deliver it. And it didn't have to go very far, but you know, we really didn't have a great idea how heavy it was. So I figured if it was me and three guys, we would have absolutely no problem moving it. Man, I was almost rudely mistaken by that. It was it was really, really heavy. Um, I made a custom cart with these big pneumatic wheels and I got a little video of that coming too, but when we went to get this thing in the back of the truck, we could barely lift it up. I'm guessing this thing was around 600 pounds. And just aside from the fact that it's so big at 11 by four feet finished and it's 30 inches tall with all the steel, the reason I didn't take the steel legs off was because they added a lot of stability to the top. And while they did add some weight, I really do think that they helped keep the top together and made sure that it wasn't gonna crown or buckle because a lot of that moving can be pretty rough on a piece of furniture like this. Once we got it in the truck, drove it a couple miles over to the town that it was going and was able to get it out on the street, put it onto my crazy mega dolly that I made and roll it into the office. You can see the way this dolly came into play here. We could not have moved this thing without it. All it is is two pneumatic wheels from Harbor Freight, basically a piece of thread and some steel plate. What I love about this project is that the conference room that this table is going to go in really lets you see it. You know, there's so much detail going into this thing with between the legs and the table and the finish. If this was going in some dark and you know dormant room that no one was going to be able to see from the rest of the office, it would kill me. But the fact that this thing is going to be visible even from the street or from inside the office through these big glass windows and doors just makes me feel like the work's going to be truly appreciated. This was a massive job. Thank you so much to Macklin, Lewis, and Kane for helping move this. I could not have done it without these guys. Uh, Lewis has a YouTube channel. He's a great young maker, and you should check him out. His links will be down below. And I am just so happy with the way this thing came out. It looks great in the room. I can't wait to see the rest of the office finished so that I can really feel it in its element. But overall, a lot of work, but it came out great. All right, that about does it for this project. This was a huge amount of work, a massive undertaking. Way more work than I thought it was gonna be, but I learned a lot from the process. I learned a lot from building it. Um, that's what's important to me. You know, I wanna learn through all my projects. I'm 
really happy with how it came out. The client's happy with it. It's going to look beautiful in this office. Check out some links below for the guys that I built this for. Great company, and they support me, so you should support them. If you want to see more behind-the-scenes stuff, what I'm doing in the shop on a daily basis, follow me here at Make Everything Shop. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Share it uh, with friends if you think they'd like to see it. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Again, I'm Chris Make Everything, and I hope to see you on the next video. Thanks.